Pushkin. I'm Jacob Goldstein. I used to host Planet Money. Now I'm starting a new show. It's called What's Your Problem? Every week on What's Your Problem, entrepreneurs and engineers describe the future they're going to build once they solve a few problems. I'm talking to people trying to figure out how to do things that no one on the planet knows how to do, from creating a drone delivery business to building a car that can truly drive itself. Listen to What's Your Problem on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen. It's a question on everyone's mind. What does it mean to live a good life? Is it about happiness or purpose, love and friendship? What about health, state of mind, status, or wealth? Can you live a good life even if you're struggling, as so many have been? These are the questions award-winning author, founder, and interviewer Jonathan Fields asks on the Good Life Project podcast. Every week, Jonathan sits down with world-renowned thinkers and doers, people like Adam Grant, Ashley Ford, Julian Castro. What's unusual about these conversations is how vulnerable the most accomplished people in the world get. You feel like you're sitting in on a deeply personal, private conversation, seeing and hearing these luminaries like never before, and learning from their experiences and ideas. Start listening now. Look for The Good Life Project on your favorite podcast app. So this is absolutely true. I didn't have any suits. I went to Paul Stewart. I bought two suits. And I saw these suspenders. The guy said, you're working on Wall Street. You know, the guys on Wall Street wear suspenders. And I'd never worn suspenders. But I saw the red suspenders with the gold dollar signs. And I thought, this will be funny. People will think it's funny. Oh, my God. (laughs) People didn't think it was funny. I mean, this was, for me, this was like, ha, I'm going to Solomon Brothers and going to play at being an investment banker. Why not dress the part? I didn't realize that I was about to enter an irony-free zone. I was just trying to make work fun. (laughs) <laughs> and instead, I looked like this asshole who actually would wear red suspenders with gold dollar signs, and it, was, it came across it, literally. You were the wolf of Wall Street. I was the wolf of Wall Street. I was not. I was like the antelope of Wall Street or the, or the rabbit of Wall Street. I was, I was not the wolf of Wall Street. Hi, I'm Michael Lewis, once the rabbit of Wall Street. Welcome to Other People's Money, a liar's poker companion. 30 years after I published my first book, I'd gone back and recorded the whole thing as a new audio book. The book is what it is, as I wrote it, but this is where I crack open all the stories behind the book. We're now at episode two, Churning and Learning on Wall Street, one of the many titles I considered and rejected for the book as a whole. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing on Wall Street. And when I got to Solomon Brothers, there were people who were hostile to my ignorance, but there were people who helped me along and kind of taught me stuff, sometimes without even knowing they were doing it. And these people found their way into the book, often pseudonymously. So just recently, I went back to a couple of these people to see kind of what they remembered from that time. One of them was a bond salesman who was next to me at the desk where they plopped me down in London when I got out of the training program. In the book, I called him Dash Riprock. And here's how I described him. He was American and only 23, two years younger than I. Still, in the way of the world, he was light years ahead of me. Dash Riprock was a proven moneymaker. Dash often made remarks I didn't understand, such as buy two-year notes and short old tens, or short Solomon stock, or save a client, shoot a geek, and expect me to figure out why on my own. Often, I hadn't a clue what he meant, but Dash, for all his pithiness, had a kind heart. And eventually, after he had sold four different money managers in three different countries on whatever new scheme he was promoting, he'd elaborate. In this way, I learned about trading, selling, and life. You called me up to Hampstead to your house and said, I want you to look at something one night. So I went up there, and that's when you showed me, like, a lot of hand, I think it was handwritten. (laughs) <laughs> it was typed out. It was like 300 pages typed out. And I sat and read it. And then I looked at you and I said, you're going to sell 7,000 copies to the 7,000 employees of Solomon Brothers. And then you're going to be unemployed and never get another job on Wall Street again. And you laughed and said, I've already sold the rights. It's coming out. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm now in a position to reveal for the first time ever the true identity of my first mentor at Solomon Brothers, Dash Riprock. 
His real name is Scott Dorf. I said to you, I go, you have to change the names in this book <laughs> because I'm making fun of the chairman. I'm making fun of you. I'm making fun of the firm. I'm hazing you mercilessly. It's, you know, uh, uh, pledge training, all this. And I was like, you really have to change my name because I'm not ready to, to leave the business here at the age of whatever, 26 or whatever I was at the time. As I remember it, when I asked Scott what he wanted his pseudonym to be, he already knew. Now, Dash Riprack turns out to be a character from the 1960s sitcom, The Beverly Hillbillies. Well, he's awful cute, Wilbur, but he ain't no Dash Riprack. <laughs> in the training program, there was a book, the equivalent of the pick book, you know, that they sent out freshman year in college back in the day, and it had all the pictures of all the people. There was probably 125 people in that class. And I had nicknamed one guy in the class Dash Riprock because he was that guy. Lived on Park Avenue, you know, drove a Porsche, you know, had, you know, $5,000 suits in 1983, you know. <laughs> so I thought it, that was a funny name. So I just stole it back from him. So when you read it, your takeaway was everyone at Solomon Brothers is going to read it, but no one else is going to be interested. Right. I thought it was way too much inside baseball. But at the end of the day, it, you know, what do you put on the cover? You know, I'm a bond salesman. I mean, who who cares? I mean, you know, nobody, there was no glory or drama in that world until, really, until your book. Did you, do you remember the reaction in the firm when the book came out? A mix of horror, fear, and glee, I'd say. It was like reading page six in the post, only 300 pages of it. There, you know, it was a parlor game. All right, who is this guy? And the ones that you protected by using pseudonyms, and there were the ones that you didn't protect <laughs> by putting their real names in. I think I think I mainly protected the little people and mainly didn't protect the big people. The real names were the names of the people who were kind of prominent in the firm. But did people quickly figure out you were Dash Riprock? Oh, th- in thirty seconds. Yeah. Did you think? Oh, I'm in trouble. Oh, I went. Uh, and I was looking for another job fairly quickly. But I, at the same time, I was not super comfortable with, you know, what was going on in the government bond department at the time and who I was reporting to and responsible to. So, and as you saw what happened shortly afterwards. Firm fell apart. It was a good time for you to write that book and me to be forced to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Did you feel like you were forced to leave? By the book? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't know that. Really? It's okay. I don't blame you. What's funny about that is Scott and I had stayed in touch after Solomon Brothers. I mean, loosely. And he never said that basically I'd ruined his career there. Uh, Never brought it up. He'd gone on to have a long and very lucrative career, like a lot of the people who I was at Solomon Brothers with. We all hit there at just the right time with this kind of tidal wave behind us to surf. And he'd gone through a number of banks and hedge funds and had only just a few months before I spoke to him retired. But he was still struck, compared to all those firms, how much power Solomon Brothers had exercised back in the day, like how different a place it was in relation to the rest of the financial system. It can't be exaggerated in terms of how much, you know, control we had over the level of U.S. interest rates and therefore global interest rates at that period, because there's obviously nothing now to compare. It's interesting what you just said about control of interest rates, because Solomon didn't have control of interest rates. I mean, the Fed has control of interest rates. So, but on a very micro level, like where this bond trades in relation to this bond. No, but on the absolute level of rates, in a way, even now, uh, you know, a single hedge fund or a single player can momentarily have a big impact on one sector of a market or one specific issue or something like that. But back then, Solomon, until a number of events shrank their control, there were periods where they would go in and they would buy every single thing that the treasury would auction and they would just keep buying. And if prices went down, they would just buy more until they turned things around. And that worked at an incredibly high percentage hit rate because they were willing to lose more money than anyone else on the path to making a ton. Solomon Brothers may have felt like it was an incredibly powerful position and entrenched, but even then, its privileged position was under assault. We just didn't fully realize it. It was just a different culture than, say, Silicon Valley is, where everybody knows enough to be paranoid. Everybody knows that someone's coming to get you and will. 
things were coming to get us, and we were oblivious to it. What happened was that the banks and the investment banks went from much smaller organizations, you know, with people who could jump around department to department, with history majors, you know, trading bonds, to much more specialized worlds where, you know, you have thousands of PhD programmers who are fighting to get one algo a millionth of a second faster than another algo. And that there's no narrative that really helps there. Your potential role is shrinking the whole time. Right. It's becoming much more just a, you're sitting at the casino and putting your chips on red or black right. as opposed to having an edge. You know, the anomalies have been arbitraged out of the business, which is how we made our living for the last 30 years. And when did you realize you come to the end of the line? When I left the last European bank, it would have been around 2015, I went to work for a client and I went to work for a large global macro hedge fund. Where you were basically trading. Yes. Doing some analyst work. I was writing for the firm. But there's essentially, you know. it's essentially acknowledgement that there isn't really much of a role for the bond salesman. Correct. If I went back and wandered the trading floors in the hedge funds of Wall Street now, would I see anything that's even vaguely familiar to me or has the world changed that much? No, you'd see nothing that was familiar. So the world that Liar's Poker describes is thoroughly changed, but Liar's Poker itself remains in some kind of time warp eternity. Why on earth are people handing this book out to kids at Harvard and saying, you got to read this if you want to know how our business works? You know, it's because it's a, a really fun era. And it would give a, you know, a, someone young who was idealistic about coming in and being able to make a difference, you know, it, it gives them some hope that is obviously completely misplaced given the modern trading environment. Gives them some hope, hope of what? That, that they could have some fun. <laughs> so that's the fun's been bled out of it. Yeah, there's no, there's no eating goldfish, you know, standing up in front of 500 people in the trading floor in Solomon, London anymore. So it's used to persuade young people that this is still a, a place full of life, where it really what it is is a place full of machines. And silence. There's just no noise. That's the amazing thing about particularly hedge funds even more than the banks. You know, you're just basically tending the machines. No one actually talks on the phone anymore. That's the bit, the most obvious physical changes. People used to stand up on their desks and yell and get in arguments and occasional fistfights. And, and then they were on the phone and, you know, there'd be a hundred open phone lines. And it was just this huge cataclysm of noise and risk and fear and greed. It was, it was a drama. There's no drama now. He's totally right there was a drama, and the telephone was at the center of the drama. I mean, the mortgage traders would hurl the phones at people's heads. They were weapons in addition to, like, instruments of communication. And when you walked onto the floor, you could hear, you know, a thousand voices at once shouting into phones, shouting at each other. But Scott, a.k.a. Dash, wasn't like that. You can hear from his voice that he's not a shouter. He's a low talker, and he would mumble into his phone. In the book, it was his phone technique that I used to introduce him to the reader. I could tell when Dash was about to sell a few hundred million dollars of government bonds because his torso would jackknife in his chair so that his chest was almost in his lap and his head went into the sound booth. Just before consummating the trade, he'd plug his empty ear with a finger on his free hand and speak rapidly in a low voice. One of his customers nicknamed him the Whispering Dash. Then suddenly, he'd pop up, hit the silencer button on his receiver, and shout into the hoot, Hey, New York, New York, you're done on October 92 to September 93s. 100 by 110. Oh, yeah. 100 million by 110 million. When he emerged from the tuck position without having sold bonds, I knew he'd been talking to his mother. It wasn't cool to talk to your mother on the trading floor. I love describing your phone technique. <laughs> The low talker. You were a low talker, and you would sometimes hide, actually go underneath your desk so nobody could hear you. W why? Well, it was loud. Yeah. Really loud. And the fact is, if you're in the middle, if you're orchestrating a transaction of, you know, a billion dollars worth of bonds that are moving really rapidly in price, and, and the, the money to be made or lost is really large sums, you really don't want a trader's shouting, yelling, hectoring, abuse. You don't want that leaking through into the phone because the trader will be screaming, I hate that customer, you know, hang up the phone. I'm never doing another trade. And you're under the thing. You don't want him to hear that as you 
complete a transaction and hope he'll come back 10 minutes later for another one. <laughs> so that's why you did it. It was editing. I thought you were afraid of people hearing what you were saying. Oh, no. No, not at all. You were afraid of, afraid of the person on the other end of the line hearing what everybody around you was saying. Right. You can't let the truth leak through. You can't let the truth leak through. It's a great line. Very dash rip rock. I want to thank Scott Dorff for revealing himself to the audience and for talking to me. Coming up after the break, we have one more pseudonymous character from Liar's Poker whose identity we're going to reveal. Maybe the most famous character in Liar's Poker, the human piranha. More than 2 million young professionals read The Hustle's daily email for its informative take on the latest happenings in the business and tech industry. Now they're bringing their irreverent tone to the airwaves with a new podcast called The Hustle Daily. Every weekday, they share what you need to know about the biggest business headlines and why you should care about them. Recently, they've talked about how major companies like Google and Disney are facing labor issues and what making daylight saving time permanent would mean for the economy. Make sure you tune in on Wednesdays, where they go deep on one idea, trend, or industry, like the economics of doomsday preppers, or the story behind the world's most popular Airbnb listing. There really is something here for everyone, so take a quick second to search for The Hustle Daily Show on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You won't regret it. I want to tell you about another podcast that tackles the big questions of the future. It's called Exponential View from the Harvard Business Review. It's hosted by Azim Azar, a serial entrepreneur, technologist, and investor. As a practitioner, Azim explores how societies are changing under the force of exponential technologies like AI, synthetic biology, renewable energy, and others. On Exponential View, Azim speaks with CEOs, policymakers, scientists, and the world's leaders about these new technologies. They tackle questions like, how will we live morally in the metaverse? And how will quantum computing change the way you do business? Find out why Daniel Ek, founder and CEO of Spotify, calls Azeem one of the most highly regarded thought leaders in the industry. Check out Azeem Azar's Exponential View wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. In Liar's Poker, there's a long section, probably too long a section, about my education in the Solomon Brothers training program. And for me, it was a way of, like, explaining to the reader all about Wall Street through these people who came before us who knew all about Wall Street. And these people were colorful and interesting, but one of them was just more interesting than all the others. And he was the human piranha. The human piranha came to tell us about government bonds. Though he was so knowledgeable about the handling of money, that he could have spoken about whatever he wished. He was the only bond salesman who made traders nervous because he generally knew their job better than they did. And if they screwed up by giving him the wrong price, he usually made a point of humiliating them on the hoot and holler. It gave other salespeople great satisfaction to watch him do this. The human piranha was short and square, like the hooker on a rugby team. The most unusual thing about him was the frozen expression on his face. His dark eyes, black holes really, rarely moved. And when they did, they moved very slowly, like a periscope. His mouth never seemed to alter in shape. Rather, it expanded and contracted proportionately when he spoke. And out of that mouth came a steady stream of bottom line analysis and profanity. I love the environment. You know, I, I love the the tension, the competitiveness, the how fast moving it was. You know, psychologically, I, I love the immediate feedback of doing a big trade. So that's the human piranha. Unlike Dash Riprock, I was too scared of the human piranha to call him and ask him what he'd like his pseudonym to be, so I just gave it to him. His real name is Tom Bernard. He was only like, I don't know, six years older than me, Though at the time, he seemed like the soul and the embodiment of a firm that had been around for 100 years. I thought of him as the person who had sort of created the firm culture or helped create the firm culture. But in fact, like everybody else, he just adapted to it. The thing that really struck me about the culture 
that's very different and and something that you know I've had to unlearn the behavior over the years was was a gallows humor. When anything really bad would happen, there was always a race to who had the gallows jokes the quickest. Yep. I encountered that day one at Salomon Brothers, and that lasted through, you know, the liar's poker years. When you say like, when something bad happened in the world. Well, if a celebrity would die, you would call around and, and the guy who had the sickest jokes, the fastest, you know, would get all the high fives. I remember coming out to uh, Snowmass to ski and I had been on the phone with the office all morning. And so I'd gotten uh, all the latest jokes on uh, uh, celebrity death. And so I'm on a ski lift with these Midwestern ladies and I start rattling off the jokes. And they looked at me like, what rock did this guy just crawl out from under? They couldn't wait to get off the ski lift with me. So <laughs> it was kind of an aha moment. I realized that, that that stuff really doesn't travel outside of Wall Street. Where do you think it comes from? What's its purpose? That's a great question. I guess the the idea that you can, you know, kind of break social boundaries or... I'll tell you one story. It actually happened. The culture was the same, but th this happened in the early 90s uh, when I was at Kidder Peabody. I sit right on the trading desk and I'm always listening to all the conversations. And it appears that this guy is scolding a clerk, which, you know, we yelled at our clients and we yelled at our competitors and we yelled at each other. But, you, you know, you didn't yell at a clerk. Kind of my ears perked up. And the last thing the guy says is, okay, well, I guess you got one less guy on the assembly line, so it's going to take you a little longer. Just get him here by Thursday. And he hangs up. And I turn around and say, Mike, what are you doing? What is that about? And Jeffrey Dahmer had been arrested that weekend for cannibalism. And my salesman was on the phone with the Ambrosia Chocolate Factory in Milwaukee, ordering crates of candy. They were going to call them Dahmer bars. They were crunchy and send them all to all their customers. And, you know, you had to guess what you were crunching on. So I'm the adult in the room. You know, I was the head of the group, so I was supposed to be the adult in the room. But I realized there would be a mutiny if I shut this down. Uh, so I negotiated that they couldn't send any Dahmer bars to the Wisconsin accounts because somebody had a cousin or whatnot that got eaten by Jeff, you know, wouldn't be as funny. No, but it wouldn't be you know, as funny. So when the bars arrived on Thursday, everybody dropped their phones and jumped on them to send them to clients and, and you know, go with this gallows joke. So that's the kind of thing that would not happen anymore. Yeah, that wouldn't happen anymore. There's so much that happened that wouldn't happen anymore. And yet, you know, I'm not totally sure that deep down, underneath the surface of the behavior, the spirit of the place has changed at all. Back then, you just saw the spirit of the place on the surface. And anyway... This is the human piranha, Tom Bernard, who had one really big effect on me. He was the one who sort of let me know I'd really made it at Solomon Brothers. And he did it in a particular way that people still talk to me about. This is how I described it in the book. The most important call of all came. It was from the human piranha. I heard you sold a few bonds, he said. I tried to sound calm about the whole thing. He didn't. He shouted into the phone. That is fucking awesome. I mean fucking awesome. I fucking mean fucking awesome. You are one big swinging dick and don't let anybody tell you different. It brought tears to my eyes to hear it, to be called a big swinging dick by the man who years ago had given birth to the distinction and in my mind had the greatest right to confer it upon me.
the legacy before the lights go out on Liars Poker, the last flash is going to be just big swinging dick. That's the thing. <laughs> That's the thing everybody remembers. And it, and it wasn't mine. It was yours. But where did you get it from? You know, it was something that was said on the trading desk. I, I never heard it until I got to Solomon Brothers. And I think it the young people kind of bastardized the meaning because when I would hear Good Friend or Strauss or, you know, Craig Coates, the senior guys use it, they would use it in, in the context of, you know, if there was an opportunity to take a ton of risk. They would say, well, if we don't buy them, you know, some other swinging dick will come in. And it, it meant that you know, you were on the edge of being overly aggressive and, and it, you know, some big swing and dick will come in and, and take down a block of, you know, half a billion overpriced bonds from GMAC. But then as, as the 80s went on, it, the definition became just as, as it was in Liar's Poker. So it went from being something, a term of maybe slight opprobrium or disapproval to a compliment. That's my perception, yeah. Yeah, What's funny about that is something similar happened with the book itself. Not just inside Solomon Brothers, but I think inside the mind of John Goodfriend, the CEO. In the beginning, he did not regard it as a compliment. And Tom Bernard remembers that beginning. This Monday morning, John Goodfriend begins a meeting by describing your book. He says that one of our employees in London, Michael Lewis, has written this book, Liar's Poker. And he gives his view, which was not very positive, <laughs> but he said he said that he thought we all should read it, but he didn't want us to buy it because he didn't want you to get the royalties. So uh, right after the meeting, I ran out to the syndicate desk, which was you know right outside the meeting room, and our publicist Bob from North Carolina was there. Do you remember him? Yeah, I do remember him. So I went up to him. He had a the galleys. And I said, Bob, am I in this book? And he said, yes. I said, am I in it by name? And he said, uh, no, but you'll recognize yourself. So I looked around and good friend wasn't there. So I ran out to Barnes and Noble to buy the book because I, I was, you know, uh, curious, curious what you, you had said about me. <laughs> And uh, so I'm looking around in the fiction section. I couldn't find it. And I, I, w I went up and asked the gentleman at the counter. I said, you know, do you have Liar's Poker? And he points over to the nonfiction section. And, and I said, w why is that in nonfiction? And that, that was the question I had after Good Friend's, you know, description of the book. You know, after I read it, I realized, you know, this is true. <laughs> this is, I don't know why I asked the guy because, you know, it's, you know, it was a very accurate portrayal of, of the environment at, at Solomon at the time. And, you know, everything you said about me and, you know, was true. Your character as it appears before the training class is maybe the second thing that will go out last with a book. People remember the human piranha. You were scary. <laughs> I mean, did you did, were you aware that you were scary? No. I I was aware that I was intense, but you know, it it was a very very intense environment. You know, I was I think you called me a denizen of the trading floor and and I was thriving on it. So good friend tells everybody to go read it somehow without buying it, which would have been hard to do. Oh, yeah. I think everybody at Solomon Brothers read the book. I, I think there was a feeling among many that it, it was, um, you were telling stories out of school that, yeah, that you that it had, was a betrayal. you know, if, you know, someone uh, talks about infidelity at the country club with the guys and it gets back to the wives, you know, that that person isn't too popular and, and with the guys anymore. You know, so there there was some of that, that, you know, you were a bit of a tattletale. It was the one little niggling feeling of kind of guilt I had about the whole enterprise was telling stories out of school. And if 
If there had been any real cohesion in the firm, I probably never would have written it in the first place. But let me tell you something that's funny, and it's a coda to the whole story, and it's that as time went by, John Goodfriend himself softened in his attitude towards the book. He would come to, like, any public talk I was giving in New York, and we would chit-chat afterwards. And then he confessed that he'd bought hundreds of copies, and he kept them in his office, and he'd sign them and give them away to people when they came to visit him. So we come full circle. Uh, We come to a place where everybody seemed to be kind of okay with it in the end. And you can hear the human piranha is is not really the human piranha anymore. He's softened. All those rides on ski lifts in Aspen has turned him into a slightly different person. He was a creature of that moment and that place, and now he's he's different. Coming up in the next episode, we're going to get another perspective on what life was like at Solomon Brothers in the 1980s and early 90s. How do you think Liar's Poker would have been different if I had been a woman? Oh, my gosh. I can only speak for myself. I don't think I could have been that balanced. I think women feel it deeper in a way. There were times when I was sobbing. There was a time I went to a lawyer and said, can I do something about this? You know, I I was treated poorly. Other People's Money is a production of Pushkin Industries. If you like the show, please remember to share, rate, and review. You can buy our new Liar's Poker audiobook, unabridged and read by me, the author, at pushkin.fm slash liarspoker and also at Audible. To find more Pushkin podcasts, listen on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You were better with customers than anybody I'd ever seen. Really? Yeah, because you believed in what you were selling. (laughs) And... (laughs) I, that's where that naivete thing comes in. And, you know, it really served you well because the customers really didn't see you as a, you know, as a used car salesman. They saw you as a as a proselytizer. I had the ability to seem like I knew what I was talking about. Right. When you actually had no clue. <laughs>